Um, just a quick review here. So um, I started off the, this with an introduction to the book of Matthew. Just It shows Jesus, Yeshua's lineage to the throne. He's the heir. Yeah, no, I'm talking off my notes, Bill. Um, so John the Baptist came and he, he brought the message, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus came right after that and he said the same thing. And I just want, I pointed out that salvation wasn't mentioned until much later. And even then, even when he told them he, he was going to die, they didn't understand it. And he never told them why he needed to die. They figured that out later on. You know, that he was killed during Passover. You know, the blood on the posts so that the angel of death passes over. Well, you've got the same thing with him. But they didn't know about that at this time. And also, there was a great multitude that heard his message. It wasn't just Jews. This message is to all of us. It's for all believers. And, um, oh, I've got my notes here. Uh, I'm going to talk about inheritance. Uh, it's through the male line, but this is for you too, ladies. There's no, there's no barrier there. You get exactly the same thing. It's just the way God did it. So uh, basically, we went through the poor, those who mourn, the meek, the righteous, the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemaker. It's quite a list, eh? Every time I look at this, I come up short. So uh, if you can get one of these, I think you're doing fairly well. Okay, so um, I just got this quickly here. I'm not going to talk about this too long, but uh, this is a book I read, Living by the Book. It's how to read the Bible. And there's nine questions you should ask every time you read the Bible. So we're going to look at a few of these. We're going to look at, is there a promise to claim? Is there a command to obey? Is there a condition to meet? Is there a verse to memorize? And is there a challenge to face? And the verse to memorize is on that handout I gave you. So we'll look at that at the end. Okay, and then, uh, so I just wanted to start off putting this in context. This is Matthew 13, 47 to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good con into containers, but threw away the bad. So what will be at the end of the age? The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteousness. That's what they understood at the time that God was going to come back and set up his kingdom, and there was going to be a separation. So it's basically uh, the gospel of God. God's going to return and judge. And you, I put a reference there from Ecclesiastes 12, 14. You can look that up. But that's not you. You're saved by the blood of Yeshua, Jesus, okay? But there's also a code of conduct for believers, and this is outlined carefully on the Sermon on the Mount, which begins in the Beatitudes. And there's a conduct and rewards here. I'm going to talk about the last two verses in there. And I just wanted to note here that you see that last verse there? That's from Revelation. This is one of the last things that Yeshua said to us. He said, Behold, I'm coming soon. I'm bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning of then. Blessed are those. Does that sound familiar? Yep, there it is again. Blessed are those who wash their robes. So, and I went over this before, the so is a, one of those conjunctions. It means the result. So the result is that they may have the right to the tree of life. That's one thing. And the second one is that they may enter the city by the gates. That's a big reward, by the way. And that word recompense, in the Greek, it's, it's uh, mythos. So it means a reward for wages or pay. It's not a gift, it's something that you earn. And it's the same word we're going to look at in the Beatitudes. Okay, so um, this, this is how all the bad Beatitudes started off. Blessed are those, and the, the, um, it's the word macarius, and there's a few Bibles that translate it as happy. I don't think that's the best translation. 
And I looked up 45 Bible translations, only three use that word. It has to do with the context. I'm going to show you the context today, why I don't think it's happy. I think joyful is a better word. In fact, we're supposed to rejoice in our suffering. And so I'm going to talk about that today too. What's our response? And then I, this is one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 4, 7. You have put more joy in my heart. You see, it's the Lord that puts the joy in your heart. Okay? So you can't get it. You can't get this kind of joy any other way than they have when they're wide and grain and abound. In other, words, in other words, people that have lots of stuff don't get this. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, make me dwell in safety. That's the blessing. A restful night's sleep. Isn't that a blessing? You don't have to worry about anything? Okay. Um, so the Beatitudes, uh, they're a description of righteous character and future rewards. But the grammar changes a lot in here. I'm going to show you this because it doesn't come through in the English. And verse 10 is the first one. It's a repeat of the blessing for the poor. It's, oh, sorry. No, it, I got the wrong one there. <laughs> it's a repeat of the, the one for righteousness sake. Sorry, that's a mistake. But it's a capstone. It's a capstone for all the Beatitudes. And I'm going to show you what righteousness means in a minute. So, just to, just to go through it before I take it apart. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we're going to look at the yellow parts here. And you can see the two persecuted. They're not the same in the Greek. And I'll, I'll show you how they're different. So uh, just want you to note that it relates to our conduct and also what happens now in this world and also what happens in the world to come. So it's quite a, it's quite a statement here for the Beatitudes. Okay, so we're just going to look at verse 10 here. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the first question we're going to ask is, what is righteousness? It's a huge topic. When I look this up, I'm only going to show you a very, very small part of it, but it's big. In God's mind, it's huge. So I went through these dictionaries here. Basically, um, you can see the references there if you want to look them up. Um, those who live and act in accordance with God's commands. That's one of them. And, and this is the big one for us. And Abraham believed, and to him was accounted righteousness. So it has to do with faith as well. And God's righteousness is a pattern for human living. So it goes down to our level. It's not just God. And Jesus gives, our, gives us his righteousness, and it's revealed primarily by him, if you look up those references. I didn't look them all up. Um, God gives his righteousness to believers, so you get part of him, his righteousness. That's your covering. And then God's righteousness to be sought after, and I do want you to look those references up tonight because they're really good, and I looked all of them up. Okay, so we're going to talk about persecuted. Um, the green is the reasons again. So blessed are those who are persecuted, the reason, for righteousness' sake. And the other reason is for the kingdom of heaven. You're going to get, you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So the, the word persecuted there is didido minoi. That's right, didido minoi. Um, yeah. It's a, I don't actually speak it, I just read it. But uh, I just want to point out in the Greek here, some of you I know want to look at this, but this little word in here, dio, that's the stem, and you add the ending here, and this, when you see this reduplication here, you bring the first letter out and put the E. If you see that in the Greek, it's, it's this special case that I've been talking about. They don't use this very much in the Greek, so when you see it, you need to pay attention because they're, they're using this on purpose. 
And this is called, it's a state of aspect. So it's a verb, but instead of the focus on the action, the focus is on the result of that action. It's on the state that it brings, okay? And so if you look at this persecution, um, it can be several things. It can be suffering for a righteous living brings about a condition in that person. So suffering brings about something in you that stays. Persecution is part of your life, and the condition has permanent implications. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute. So why, why does the grammar change there to a permanent state or condition brought on by persecution? So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that. Does it line up with the rest of the Bible? Because you don't want to do anything off a piece of grammar. So I'm just going to walk you through some scriptures here quickly. So what does Peter say? 1 Peter 3, 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, sound familiar? You will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. Notice that. When you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior may be put to shame. And he continues on in verse 3, 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Interesting, eh? And that, that keeps going. And it goes into verse 4. Since, that's the reason of all this stuff again. So he just continues from verse 3 to verse 4. The reason is because Christ suffered in the flesh, so arm yourself with the same way of thinking. And the other reason is, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Also very interesting. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. These are the reasons why you need to do this. As to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So I just summed up at the bottom there. Suffering connected with the struggle against sin. It's also relates to future blessings. And here's the really important part. It's a good conscience. Yep. So you, you, you feel good that you've done the right thing. It, it's inside you, remember? It's not external. And then we're just going to look at a couple more here. That's Peter. And James, here's the one by James that lots of people hate this one. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So I've talked about this before. There's a difference between salvation and sanctification. This is what he's getting at here. And then Paul. Um, Philippians 1.29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you shall not only believe, that's the first one, but also suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict I saw, that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So that's Paul's message, and he gets even more to the point in uh, Acts. But it, in 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, yes, all that live godly, that's righteousness, those are the parts of the Beatitudes, shall suffer persecution. So it's something that happens, right? It's not something unusual. And then Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Interesting, eh? That's what he's saying. And that word trib tribulation there, there's the Greek word, it means Affliction, anguish, burden, persecution, tribulation, and trouble. Yeah. And then John. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So, um, So I was just trying to lay out that this isn't something unusual, okay? It's, it's through, all, through all of the, the rest of the New Testament. We don't talk about it very often, but it is something that's there. And then Matthew 5.11, this is the second verse. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for 
your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets before you. Okay, so the first thing I want you to notice here is in the translation, you'll see that it, it switches from those to you. Okay, that's the, those are the third person, you is the second person. So when, he, when they say those, they're people being spoken about. When he says you, he's talking to you. And the you is plural there. So this is a message directed right at you, whereas the other ones weren't. Okay, so you, that's the first thing I want you to notice. And then the words revile, persecute, and other. These are subjunctive verbs. I know you don't know what that is, but it's in, it's, the rest of it's written in um, a mood that's real in, in terms of what the author thinks, but this part's written with some uncertainty. Okay, so the uncertainty's on the when. You see that when at the top? So that's the uncertainty. It's when it happens. So you can either let it happen or you can push it off. It will happen sooner or later, but um, this is a message directed at you. He's, he's actually, um, I think he's actually asking, will you allow this to happen? It's like he's asking us if we're going to do this for him. And then the response, I want you to notice this too. It says, you see those words, rejoice and be glad? Well, in the Greek, these are, these are actually commands or very strong suggestions. The grammar changes again. He's, he's telling you, you need to rejoice. So I want you to pay attention to that too because that's your response. And if you look at the apostles, that's exactly what they did. They rejoiced when they, through their suffering. And then if you go down to the last one, there's that green word again, for, that's the reason. Okay, why should we rejoice? Well, your reward, that's that same word then again, uh, mythos. It's a reward for wages and pay. It's for payment of service. It's not a gift. Okay, salvation's the gift. You can't earn that part. But it has to do with inheritance as a son and a firstborn. I'm going to show you this because uh, I hadn't seen this before, but I'm starting to look at this now. Okay, so we have uh, Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoptions as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Okay, so you're an heir. And the second part is and fellow heirs with Christ, but there's a condition there, okay? You see that in green? Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with, with him. So basically, what, what, the, what it's saying is, you're already an heir, you're, you're already a son of God. That's your salvation part, you get that. You don't have to work for that, you got it. But he's saying, um, it's got to do with the firstborn, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. It says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth. So he's inherited the firstborn from the Father, everything. Christ is the firstborn of a new family. He gets a double portion, and it's actually more than a double portion. I'm going to show you that. But what does he do with it? The first thing he does, he turns around and says, I want you to get this too. He, you know, it, it's not like us. You know, we would probably keep it and give a little bit of money away to each person, right? But he's saying, no, no, no. You can get exactly what I got. Well, almost exactly what he's got. But there's a condition there. So we get, oh, uh, there's also, may also be glorified. This is, again, this is one of these verbs that has some uncertainty in it. So he's just saying, if you want to get what I got, you got to work for it. But I'm giving you sonship. You don't have to worry about going to hell. But, but your position in the kingdom, you need to work for. So we get, we get the son's reward by faith, but we get to share in the double portion as a co-heir. He's offering you a co-heir. Do you see that? It's not something to take lightly. He's offering you a lot of stuff. He's offering you as much as he can give you. But you have to work for it. You need to be tested. And then, 
Ephesians 3, 1, 3 to 14. I don't know if you notice this. So in, in here, this is about salvation. And so I just highlighted the parts in yellow. Look at what he does for us. It's all about him. Blessed be the Lord God, our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should not only be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of the will and to the praise of his glorious grace, which he's blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins and our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, again, to unite all things in him, again, things in heaven and earth. In him, again, we have attained an inheritance. That's what I was talking about. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. That's what I read before. In him, again, also when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, again, until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. It's pretty good, eh? You, just, you get that part. That's all about him. So, uh, I hadn't noticed this before, but if you, if you read the book of Hebrews, if you read it carefully, you'll see that the author is trying to make a point here about the firstborn blessing. He's trying to show you that Jesus, Yeshua, took all of it. And there's more than one blessing when I researched this. It's not just material blessing. There's more. I'm going to show you this in a second. Okay, so um, Hebrews 1. Long ago and at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds... Sorry. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right high of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. And I gave you the reference in Deuteronomy. You can look that up as a firstborn blessing. The second one is authority. You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor everything in subjection under his feet. So if you read Gen uh, Genesis thirty-seven twenty-one, the family leadership was lost by Reuben. Okay? So you can actually lose the firstborn blessing. And then number three, this is the other blessing, the high priest that he's got. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of the house than the house itself. And you can see, if you look up Numbers 3, 12 to 13, you'll see that the tribe of Levi was considered firstborn because they were the priests. And then, there's also another one, strength and procreation. So if you look at uh, Numbers 2, um, Judah gets this. And if you look at Genesis 49.10, you'll see that because Reuben and, and, and Simon and Levi were all disqualified due to sin. And I, so I went back and looked at this because I'd never seen this before. And I went back and looked at Numbers 2, and you can see Judah does have... The, the most people, and they list the 10 tribes here. And then um, in First Chronicle 5, 1 Chronicle 5.1, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. Reuben was the firstborn. 
But he, because he defiled his father's couch, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he could not be enrolled as the oldest son. So you can lose that. And the other example is Esau sold his birthright. Now they're both still sons. They don't lose that part. They just learn, lose the, the extra blessings on top of that. That's what, that's what happens. And it's the same with you. You don't lose your, your, as a son or a daughter, you don't lose that. And it, it says, Israel is the firstborn nation. That's Exodus 4.22. Then you say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So the, the firstborn blessing has now gone to Yeshua Jesus. The father gave him everything. There's nothing that, that he doesn't get. And as I mentioned, he just turns around and he's offering this to all of us. So if you want to get this stuff, I imagine it's pretty good. You know, I don't think you could even begin to understand what he's offering you here. And then Hebrews 12. So don't grow weary. So this is why. Consider whom endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? There it is again. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. And that's from Proverbs 3. I wrote it there. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. That's from Psalm 119. Is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. There it is again. He keeps going over and over this. For what son is there whom his father will not discipline? If you were left without discipline in which all participated, then you are illegitimate sons and children and not sons. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for a God is a consuming fire. So that's, uh, I hope I went through that okay. Um, so what do we do about this? I mean, that was the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount, to, to try and teach us how to act and walk. So I gave you the handout there. Um, I'll get to that in a second. So just remember the adoption as a son and a firstborn. If you want, If you want these gifts, you can get them. But you have to... Um, be worthy of it. The extra stuff is what I'm talking about. So next time you feel like you're persecuted, you don't hear this very often, but I want to tell you this. If you feel you're being persecuted, check the circumstances. If it's for God's righteousness, he might be trying to step you up. He's trying to give this stuff away, you guys. He's trying to give it to you. He wants you to have it. So don't be too quick to avoid suffering. And suffering's part of rejecting sin. I went through that before. And remember where you're going. You're being offered a place in the kingdom. This is pretty good. I know you don't see it now, but you are getting a, a huge, huge honor. So don't forget that. Okay, so our conduct is important. So I didn't go through the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe someday we can do that. But I gave you the handout there. I want everybody to memorize the Beatitudes. Lots of people know the Ten Commandments, but they don't know the Beatitudes. So I want to memorize it. If you go through it five minutes every night, in two weeks, you'll have it done. And then just keep saying that to yourself every day so that you become that. It's not easy to do. And then I'm just going to leave. Oh, yeah, this is really important, too. We all start at different places. So you can't compare yourself to someone else. Never do that. It's where you start from that's important. And there's always forgiveness. Okay, so don't fall into that trap. That's a trap from the enemy to do that. And Romans 8, 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. And your response is rejoice. That's what Paul's telling you. 
And he's telling, he's also saying to us that we have a hard time understanding what we're actually getting. He's saying your suffering is a, a small part of what you're going to get. So I think we all need to be thankful for this, always. There's, you know, I know this life is hard and there's things that upset us, but really, in the end, you're going to get a lot of stuff, right? And I think that's all I got to say. So I'm hoping that uh, you guys will read that. And also on that sheet I gave you, also on the back, there's the Beatitudes. I gave you a little description. But on the, on the back, this is really interesting because the fruit of the Spirit lines up with the Beatitudes. So if you want to understand the Beatitudes, go and look at the correlation I did there between the fruit of the Spirit because it'll help you a lot to understand what each Beatitude means. Okay? And I think that's it. Uh.